now I'd like to introduce you to Ted Fellows, the founder and president of Fellows Research. He is an, an advisor to firms investi investing in repair and supply chain digital solu solutions, boosting OEM parts trade and productivity. Ted has 30 years of experience in general management, product management, and business development for service parts solutions in automotive and adjacent industries. Ted? Thank you, Michael, for your generous introduction. And welcome and good afternoon to everyone. And my special thanks to Mize for inviting me to speak today. Parts e-commerce is reshaping the automotive service sector, the service parts sector. Simultaneously, megatrends are on track to revolutionize maintenance and repair. Today, we will focus on the intersection of OEM parts e-commerce and the impact of these megatrends, primarily from the perspective of parts sold by OEMs and their dealer networks. Associated with this webinar are three guest blog blogs that I've authored that Mize has posted and which provide context and fill in some holes as we move swiftly through this timely but complex topic. So here's the agenda. In this presentation, we will cover <clears throat> an intro to parts e-commerce in terms of its benefits, market size, and how it actually works for replacement parts, which is different than e-commerce for other items. Next, we'll drill into parts specification and its critical significance to parts e-commerce. After covering both continuous and disruptive parts e-commerce innovations, we'll review a few megatrends that are relevant. And finally, we'll wrap up with conclusions and recommendations. While I'll focus on the automotive sector and North America, as time allows, I will identify significant differences for off-highway vehicles, equipment for Europe, and other sectors not directly covered. So what's in it, what's in it for you, the listener? Parts e-commerce warrants our attention because it benefits OEMs, their dealer networks, and service parts buyers in the following ways. OEMs and dealers sell more parts as a result of e-commerce. They achieve a greater market share relative to what would have been competing against aftermarket and salvage parts. OEM, OEMs and dealers reduce expensive and disruptive parts returns. Uh, e-commerce uh, e boosts dealer parts department staff productivity substantially, uh, and it enables and facilitates powerful OEM programs that would not, could not otherwise practically uh, exist. And it boosts the satisfaction of shops and vehicle owners. Parts buyers want and expect e-commerce. Recently, research I've conducted revealed that US car dealers are on track to sell nearly 7 billion in parts online in 2020. But that success is distributed unevenly, and it's not simple. I track four separate major market segments and five distinct classes of e-commerce platforms. As with all revolutions, there will be winners and losers. Today, we outline a path, perhaps your path to success in parts e-commerce. So this is the flow diagram slide. That's the first of two diagrams I'll throw at you. Let's take a closer look at the how of parts e-commerce. This flow diagram is for a portal and with small changes could also depict other parts e-commerce types, including dealer parts websites, marketplaces, and OEM websites. Now we'll follow the diagram's red boxes and red lines. First, parts, parts buyers must specify the part numbers. Note, specification, whether by web parts catalog, OEM catalog, or automated fitment validation widget is critical so that only parts that fit a specific vehicle or equipment are ordered. In automotive, we often say VIN specific parts. For non-automotive, substitute serial number for VIN. And then note the two chains of boxes in uh, black that, that uh, go down the, uh, the slide, these are a partial set of additional cap key capabilities that parts e-commerce facilitates or even enables. Part specification over time. So this is the second of two diagrams. And the point here is that a crucial 
an absolutely essential prerequisite to OEM parts e-commerce is the accurate specification of part numbers, uh, and particularly OEM part numbers. So let's step back and look at this diagram, which compares the difficulty and complexity of parts, OEM part specification. That is the process of identifying the correct full part number to the actual performance of part staff at dealerships performing part number specifications over the decades. Amazingly, OEM part specification improves year to year despite rising challenges. Let me call out two specific thoughts. First, growing OEM data and catalog complexity. So you'll see the blue curve rising from the diagram's lower left. For example, up to nearly an order of magnitude, more active service parts SKUs <clears throat> exist now uh, as compared to several decades ago for, uh, on, from an OEM to OEM basis. And an even bigger growth has occurred in vehicle configurations and options. So things have gotten more difficult. And the second line, we have a falling number of errors, uh, training effort, time to do the lookup. So you see the green curve that falls from the upper left. Um, and what this is saying is that the experience and training is dramatically down to, to, in order to specify parts. Speed to do the specification is up tremendously, and there are far fewer errors. And this is due to advances in EPCs and equally important improved parts catalog authoring by OEMs and their technology partners. Part specification is advancing to where buyers who are not experts in OEMs, parts catalogs, and data can specify parts accurately and comfortably, which in turn is what enables parts e-commerce. Okay, so part specification over time, my roadmap slide. Let's cover a few uh, recent and emerging specification improvements that are particularly helpful uh, to parts e-commerce. First, uh, leveraging service and warranty operations data and documents. So I'd ask you to uh, close your eyes and imagine that there's a parts buyer selecting, uh, rather than directly selecting the parts, selecting a service operation or a warranty operation. Then the e-commerce application returns a set of part types, which the e-commerce application then, via an automated fitment tool, converts the, to VIN-specific part numbers automatically. That is, you end up with a kit of part numbers for all needed parts and ones that precisely fit that vehicle or equipment. And this is all without users having to directly specify the individual parts. So this is sort of a, a breakthrough capability that's emerging. We also have an increased uh, ability to do good, better, best uh, for multi-brand OEM. So General Motors might have the GM branded parts, but also AC Delco, and they've got multiple lines within that. So second line or substitute parts are automatically presented uh, with the same, same fitment of primary OEM part numbers. So you could have value, market value parts, value line, heavy duty, performance, remanufactured, and other classes, uh, giving the uh, OEM and dealer an opportunity to sell more uh, OEM parts uh, across different uh, performance and price profiles. And then finally, uh, what I think is most interesting uh, in this roadmap is predictive analytics, uh, alerting the buyer and the seller uh, to, to new opportunities in specifying parts. So let me give you the first example. Uh, if you uh, entered a vehicle uh, into an e-commerce solution and it said for that vehicle, the most common repairs for that vehicle for this time of year, for this region, are these 40 service procedures. And if you select any one of them, uh, you get the full set or kit of parts. And then the, the other idea behind predictive analytics, you could have a parts order assembled by the buyer and then the e-commerce software using predictive analytics going through and identifying uh, parts that should also be in that order given the parts that have been selected. So this might be a mandatory part related to uh, warranty. If you change a part, you must have another change or uh, even more 
cleverly noticing that if there's uh, a hood, where are the fasteners? So additional and spe special capabilities. In the previous slide, we covered new approaches to parts specification that makes parts e-commerce work in a wider range of cases. Now let's consider what disruptive innovations come with parts e-commerce e and the business improvements that that delivers. So in addition to and separate from the continuous type improvements, some of which we covered in the previous slide, parts e-commerce can deliver the following disruptive uh, innovations. So that were not otherwise uh, possible. So let's start with OEM pricing programs built right into e-commerce. So the first of these that I'm gonna mention, and there's, there's more than I have here, uh, dynamic pricing. So for example, General Motors today of the roughly 500,000 active SKUs that they have, nearly 100,000 of them do not have a, a static price. The OEM is able to control uh, the MSRP on the fly depending on uh, a variety of information. Uh, then there's price matching, uh, which is popular in automotive so that an OEM part can be uh, partially matched on price or fully uh, right there in the e-commerce uh, generating substantial additional volume. National account type pricing could be implemented. Uh, the second uh, category of disruptive changes is uh, parts ordering can now be 24 by seven. Uh, as you don't, as the dealership is often not open the same number of hours and days uh, that the fleets are operating, that the independent repairers are operating. And finally, I think perhaps the most significant and the trickiest uh, element that's uh, a disruptive change uh, that's a bit counterintuitive, a lot of folks, when they first implement parts e-commerce, think that they can eliminate all the human touches. They can just simply uh, specify an order, shoot it over, have it go into the ERP and place the order, uh, eliminating the collaboration, the human review. But unlike uh, e-commerce for ordering, I guess, you know, paper for your printer, or ink for your printer, uh, for replacement OEM parts, uh, this is unwise. You can, you can drop the time spent in effectively collaborating on the phone now by 70% because the buyer and seller review only exceptions and then get on to missing parts and delivery timing and special issues. Uh, but you can't completely short, shortcut the collaboration and drive it to zero, skip over it, at least not universally at, at initial implementation. Otherwise, things can go very badly. Collaboration not only saves time, it can actually boost sales and improve buyer satisfaction. So this, this uh, takes us to our megatrends. Uh, and the first slide's got the three uh, uh, biggest ones that we'll cover. Uh, we're gonna start with connected vehicle, uh, which, which is effectively IoT or Internet of Things for vehicles, or it could be for equipment. It's a bright spot. This is really the brightest uh, spot in terms of megatrends for OEMs and their dealer networks. Increasingly, a proliferation of sensors and computing power allows vehicles and heavy equipment to flag potential problems before there's actual, actually a failure, uh, before the idiot light in your dashboard could even turn on, and it now can transmit that data to the OEM. The OEM can analyze the diagnostic codes and sensor data, and then direct the vehicle to an authorized service point and ensure uh, that the parts are light, that are likely to be needed are also there. And that's an important additional uh, process. So uh, drivers uh, have a tendency to go where their vehicle directs them. Over 60% or approximately 60% of dealers will follow their, their vehicle's guidance to drive to an authorized repairer according to a McKinsey study. So they, they ran a study that said, if your car said there was a problem and that you should drive it uh, to this dealer uh, right now, 60% of drivers would do that. Um, and then in working on a article I was writing, uh, Hyundai told me that this percentage, 60% climbs dramatically when the OEM also concurrently calls or texts the vehicle's driver or owner uh, to alert them to the issue and to schedule an appointment. 
So the next thought is with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, service operations and part sets can be associated with particular diagnostic and sensor readings. So imagine this scenario. The vehicle to be serviced is at a fleet maintenance center. An e-commerce order from the fleet to a dealer is opened and it automatically links to the OEM. And then when it uh, sees that there's uh, previously been some uh, information uh, from, from the connected vehicle or the IoT, it pulls, that, pulls down the vehicle sensor data, pre-populates a wholesale OEM parts e-commerce order, uh, you know, which is just stunning. The runway for parts e-commerce dis disruptive innovative capabilities uh, goes on and on in terms of what connected uh, vehicle and IoT can do uh, for uh, parts and service. Okay. Next slide. Uh, no, no, no. Excuse me. Go back. I'm sorry. I misspoke. So the, uh, the first, first one took a while. So the second one I'll cover more briefly, uh, right to repair. Uh, and right to repair is a hot topic. Uh, it, it can be controversial, but it's, it's not only important, uh, in large part, it's inevitable. And it will make uh, independent repairers more important, and that may make uh, OEMs and their dealer networks unhappy, uh, but it's, it's inevitable. Uh, and that will put more, uh, that'll add importance uh, to actually selling the OEM parts. So if you don't get the labor, if you can't have a whole loaf of bread, can you have half a loaf? And if you can't have half a loaf, can you have a quarter loaf? So it becomes vital to sell the OEM parts to the actual service provider, whether that's an internal fleet maintenance center or an independent service operator. Um, and in order to make sure that you're going to get that parts business, you're going to have to consider the CX, the customer experience of the buyer. And in turn, that's going to drive you to a need for a superior e-commerce platform, not just something that you slap together, but something uh, that's got all the right pieces and is going to make people effective and comfortable. But if you're interested in knowing more about the impacts of right to repair uh, and how that's uh, evolving as we're running short of time, uh, I suggest that you read uh, the blog that I wrote on this topic. Uh, there's a version on the MISE website as well as the fellow's uh, research website, or feel free to, to reach out to me after this web webinar. The third megatrend on this slide is electrification. And I'll just hit some highlights. And again, like the, the other, if you have further questions, uh, ask them at the end of the webinar or follow up later. So eventually, uh, electrification can drive down parts consumption uh, by 50 or 60 percent, and uh, perhaps even as fast or, or faster than that, three to three and a half percent uh, natural uh, per annum growth that Michael mentioned uh, in his introduction. So there, there's a, a theoretical possibility that electrification is going to uh, wipe out a lot of parts growth and maybe even cause it to decline. However, remember a couple of things. Hybrids don't count here because they've still got an ICE, an internal combustion engine. And it's going to take decades, even in the automotive sector, to replace the existing car park. And I'll point out here, as I said I would, that this applies uh, primarily to automotive. It does apply worldwide, only secondarily to commercial truck and less so in most other uh, industries. So this is the last of the uh, uh, five of the eight megatrends that we're going to cover. Uh, and the, the next, the first one on this sheet, uh, collid collision avoidance, primarily applies uh, to automotive. So I'm going to try to go through it uh, quickly because I realize some of you on the call uh, are not in automotive. The current level of ADAS, or Advanced Driver Assisted Systems, uh, that seems to be a unanimous belief that it could cut uh, collisions in the next decade by 30% uh, or so, and that level five autonomous vehicles may uh, further reduce collisions by up to 90%. However, uh, what most uh, uh, the, of those who study human behavior will point out uh, is that this is likely to be mitigated by, what, by what's known as risk compensation. And that's the tendency for people to adjust their behavior in response to uh, perceived risk levels. 
So we'll all remember that in NFL, they kept adding more safety in and uh, more, more and more pads and helmets. And yet the players then did riskier and riskier things so that while injuries went down, they didn't go down nearly at the expected level. Uh, and so I'm going to skip over the, sh the sharing economy uh, has a number of impacts, but they're not, not, it's not clear what will happen for service parts. Let's talk about marketplaces for a minute. So marketplaces are like uh, Amazon and eBay, and they certainly get a tremendous amount of press, uh, and, and fairly so. They've, they're changing the world for many uh, different items in e-commerce. But for OEM parts, uh, it's not at all clear how far that will go. And, and I would argue perhaps not very far and not very fast. Their sweet spot is fast moving parts. Uh, and it's really to the retail side of the business. And there are a number of reasons for this. Um, and it's particularly popular uh, when it is used by dealers for idle and overstock. So there's going to be an impact, uh, but it's, it's uh, going to be complex and attenuated. Let's just take a minute on 3D printing. Uh, I, can, I remember, I don't know, five, 10 years ago, uh, people saying that 3D printing would be highly disruptive uh, to service and parts. Uh, but that really hasn't been the case uh, because its sweet spot is high value, low volume, urgently needed parts where the functionality, durability, and safety is not lessened uh, by producing the part uh, locally. There are also some legal and licensing uh, issues. And then finally, uh, and I, I could have put this at the beginning, is the rise of e-commerce in general. So uh, everyone, the, everyone is expecting more and more uh, abilities to do things online, to place orders, uh, and that is a mega trend that clearly impacts the parts and service business uh, with more and more people, uh, for example, uh, uh, going ahead and, and setting up a service appointment with the dealership online and ordering more and more parts online. What I suggest uh, for everyone on the call, uh, if you're an OEM uh, in particular, uh, if you're a dealer, if you're a solutions parts developer, take a fresh look at your service parts, part solutions and ask yourself and your teams the following questions. Are you well positioned to start and, and or grow the e-commerce channels for, replacement, for your replacement parts? Uh, can your current EPC or practical variants of that EPC facilitate effective parts e-commerce with fleets and independent repairs? And does your current path include a full set of seamless integrated parts and service apps? I would suggest that if your answers are not all yes, then that you should ask leading solution vendors to meet with you and share their visions, that you look to experts and thought leaders to craft strategic and tactical plans to get you from, from here to where you can be a winner in parts e-commerce, I would suggest that you stay engaged in webinars like this one, conferences and other knowledge transfer opportunities. A final thought, uh, thought leadership is key. The rate of change seems to be accelerating. Don't navigate these waters alone. Find the right technology partners to supply the insight and expertise needed for you to emerge as a winner as e-commerce sweeps, sweeps across service parts. And on that, I say good luck.